weeks in a new series on uh, from the book of Acts, looking at how the Holy Spirit uh, impacts our life and transforms the way we relate to each other, the way we live, the way we relate to God, uh, the way we see ourselves, and, uh, and, and how the Holy Spirit unleashes us to be the people that uh, God always meant for us to be when He first made us. Um, so I want you to turn, if you have your Bibles, we to turn to Acts chapter 4, the very end of the chapter, and then we're going to Acts 5. And i got to tell you, this is one of the, 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 the weirder chapters in the Bible to preach on. Um, I would avoid this at all costs, but the problem is when you're going through a book in the Bible, it kind of comes up. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, the, the church is brand new. Uh, 3,000 new converts have joined, and um, and so um, now we see in verse 32, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, and they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. They were there were no needy persons among them, and from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as they had need. Then, verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, it says, whom the apostles called Barnabas. And for those of you who've been in Sunday school, you know Barnabas is going to really surface a lot in the book of Acts. Uh, they called him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, which is not a bad nickname, actually. Uh, he sold a field that he owned, and he brought the money, and he put it at the apostles' feet. Now here's where it gets a little hinky. Now there was a man named Ananias, and together with his wife Sapphira, had also sold a piece of property. And with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and you've kept for yourself the money that you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied to people, but you've lied to God. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. That's a tough one to preach. He fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. And then the young men came forward, wrapped up the body, carried him out, and buried him. That'd be highly trained ushers at this point. <laughs> Uh, about three hours later his wife came in not knowing what happened and Peter asked her tell me is this the price you and Ananias got for the land she said oh yeah that's the price and Peter said well how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord look the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they'll carry you out too not one of his more tender sermons <laughs> then at that moment she fell down at his feet and died and young men came in finding her dead carried her out and buried her next to her husband and great fear seized the whole church no kidding <laughs> I should have saved this for a stewardship Sunday <laughs> so Lord teach us teach us how we might live and how we might follow you and how we might uh, be the people that you call us to be uh, Teach us from this difficult passage. Amen. Well, so I was going to call this sermon uh, Give, uh, Give or Die. But, uh, <laughs> but then I thought, wait a minute, these people did give quite generously and they still died. So give and die. That's, a, that's not a great motivation probably. But um, the thing I love about this passage, and the reason I put in chapter 5 or the end of chapter 4 is that it really all goes together because it shows that this community of believers that was emerging, and remember like 3,000 new converts uh, a few days earlier, and it still says that they were one in heart and mind. All the believers together, they were one in heart and mind, and I think that is one of the most profound descriptions of what the church can be. Rarely seen, probably maybe <laughs> hardly ever seen, maybe glimpses, but the idea that people as unique and different as all of you and me, uh, that we could actually have a unity of heart and mind uh, and that the Lord is so leading us and so present in our lives and in our situations that um, there's no debate about what God would have us do. Because 
it just is self-evident. Well, of course, this is what God has for us. And, uh, and so the, the idea that the, that the church is together, hardly knowing each other in some ways, and yet there's unity in the purpose and the vision and the direction and, and the, their relations. And that's the context for this very bizarre uh, experience. So as they talk about everybody shared and nobody was needy and all those things, they mention Joseph the Levite whom gets to be known as Barnabas, son of encouragement. And it's a very sweet thing, right? He sold the field that he owned and he brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, I always thought that's the good example and then Ananias and Sapphira do the bad example and you have a contrast. Until I started studying this and realized, wait a minute, the Levites take a sacred vow never to own property. Oh, darn right it's right. <laughs> Don't act so surprised. <laughs> they take a sacred vow not to own property. So this Joseph, right? He's not a hero. He's a scoundrel. And yet, all through the Bible, we talk about, oh, Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, he's so great. But what happens is, he's now following Jesus, and he realizes his, his life, he's got this secret. He's violating his sacred vows that he's taken for his life, and he's got a secret stash of land and property. It's probably difficult because he can't even go and visit it because people will, say, what are you doing walking around on your land, you know? And, uh, and so... Uh, so I would assume wanting to come clean, wanting to get a fresh start following Jesus, he says, okay, I'm gonna sell the lamb, give it to the Lord, okay. And he does that. As a way of cleaning up his act and moving forward in freedom and in grace, right? Not out of duty because he's had this secret all along, what if I get found out? I'm a total fraud. And, uh, and yet everybody thought he was such an encourager as a fraud. There are two realities going on there. Not unlike uh, what happens in our lives. And, um, and so you have that. And then it goes into the, the other parallel one, which is another uh, fraud, another secret. See, see, both examples are based on lies. See, that's, the, that's the part that's so cool in the Bible. There's no heroes except Jesus, basically. And, um, and so you have both of them living lies. One repents and finds freedom, and the other connives and finds a different kind of freedom, you know, I guess. Freedom from life. And, uh, and so um, it becomes a very uh, disturbing picture. Now, um, Work with me here. I'm going to go high tech. Um, <laughs> yeah. We also do a laser light show later. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is uh, Barnabas's uh, experience, right? And over here we get Ananias and Sapphira's experience. Okay, and, and they both, this is, I want to show you kind of the circle of how uh, this plays out from the scripture. Now first of all, both of them start with the same thing as, as we do in our lives. And that is, they start with a desire. Um, all of us have desires, right? We want things, we long for things, we pray for things. Uh, uh, and, and what does God say about our desires? Does it say, thy desires aren't evil and will bring you down? Something like that? Yeah, he'll give us the desires of our heart. There's nothing wrong with desires. See? God wants to bless us and he wants us to... to uh, have our desires fulfilled, but something happens. And here's what I want to show you this contrast. For Barnabas, his desire led to a passion. Passion for the Lord, passion for the community, for the people, for the ministry, for what God's doing in, in his midst, and, and all of these things. And you can just sense, 
uh, him saying, I want to be a part of this, but I've been carrying this lie. I've been deceiving. I've got a false life going on here. I want to be free from that, and I want to move forward. And so uh, he's passionate about uh, what's going on, and it leads him to a commitment which he says, okay, I'm selling that land, I'm, I'm getting free from my lies, my secrets, and I'm going to turn it over. And I walk away a free person, right? A, a demonstration of his commitment. And out of that comes a wholeness that you're going to see in the rest of Acts, wherever Barnabas comes up, he is reaching out to people, He's drawing them in, he's nurturing them, he's encouraging them. I mean, he, it's an amazing ministry that takes place from this moment on. When he finally says, I don't want to live the secrets. I don't want the secrets to dominate me, right? And so you have this picture, desire, a passion, a commitment to wholeness. Not bad, right? The way it's supposed to be. Now we have this other one, it still starts at the same place. And a nice the fire of this desire. They want to look good in the community. They want to get all the, you know, probably people were going, wow, that, that Joe, he was really generous, you know, and look what he did selling that land. And they went, you know, they would think we're pretty cool too. And uh, this was the beginning of um, people trying to look good in church, you know, and uh, we don't have to worry about that. We don't look that good, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's all right. Uh, but their, their desire led to something else, temptation. That's kind of what that says, if you, if you could read uh, Westphalian writing. Uh, their desire led to a temptation, which was, what was the temptation? Not to be free of their secrets, but their temptation was to take control, come up with a plan, right, of how they were going to do this, how they were going to present it. They agreed together on it. They worked the whole thing out so that they could achieve their desires with this great, um, this great plan of theirs. And, and Peter says, you know, that, that it was Satan actually that, that put the temptation in, in them. Which led me to think, you know, every time I get an idea that, you know, I think I could work this out pretty good. You know, here's a situation. I could come up with a plan. I could control the outcome of this. I need to probably be asking myself, or you need to be asking me, could that be Satan, John? <laughs> telling you, telling you that you can be in control, right? And, and so uh, I think we need to suspect ourselves when we get any plans and ideas that lead to control. And I got to tell you, I hate preaching this because I love being in control, or at least pretending like I am. I love thinking I am, uh, even when I'm not. And, uh, you know, Damien and I have this thing where, you know, last week I was helping him with his car, and we had to go over to the gas station over on 145th and Greenwood. And so he drove, and I was in the car. And I tell you, you know, it's only, it takes five minutes maybe to get over there to that Arco station. I must have yelled 10 times. And I'm working that brake pedal over on the passenger side, you know, the one that my mom had one of those too. And, uh, and I'm just thinking, don't you see? Oh, why don't, oh, you know. And so at the gas station, he, he walks over, hands me the keys. Dad, I can't take it. <laughs> you drive back to the church. Oh, no, Damien. No, no, Dad. You drive back to the church, you are so controlling, I can't, I can't take it even for five minutes. And I thought, you know, well, you know, he's a kid, you know, it's probably, you know. And, and then I went down to Portland Thursday to see a friend of mine who's struggling with um, kidney cancer. And, um, and he said, could we go over, he's from Illinois, and they didn't have an Ikea where he lived. And so he said, could you go over and show me that Ikea? It was like three blocks down. And then about halfway there, he goes, you are really impossible to have in a car if you're not driving. Amen. <laughs> How about a little sympathy? 
I mean, literally just going up the road to the Ikea, and I'm, I'm, you know, just going, John, I'm older than you. I've been driving, you know. I, but anyway, so my control tendencies are satanic, okay? That, that's what I'm trying to say here. And, uh, and I bring the same to every relationship. Uh, so then uh, the control, the temptation, the control leads to the cover-up, right? Instead of being released from the secret, instead of being released from the lie and discovering freedom, when temptation and control comes in, the main thing is to protect the lie, to protect the secret, to, de to defend that, the very thing that'll kill us. And, and so, uh, you know, one of the things I learned from Bruce Larson early, early on was it, it's our secrets, it's the things we try and hide that, that rise up and kill us. They take control of us. It's not the things that we confess. And, and I think that's why Jesus said, uh, you know, confess your sins because they'll lose their power. But he said, if you're really good about something, like maybe a really good prayer or something, he said, well, why don't you go in a closet and shut the door and, and do it there? Don't, don't brag about that. And, and I think that's his way of saying, if you... Uh, let go of the things that you need to confess, they lose their power over you as they're out in the open. We don't have to be afraid of them. We don't have to protect them. We don't have to. But, uh, and, and then the things that we hide grow, consume us, take over. So, so if you have some spiritual gift or blessing or something good, even a little you know, mustard seed of faith, if you hide that away, that'll grow. Now, if you walk around and say, I've got a mustard seed of faith, hey, I'm moving mountains, well, then that'll actually, that'll lose its power <laughs> very quickly, you know. And, uh, and it's a, almost a reverse um, strategy from our contemporary world of, you know, uh, speaking things into being and positive self-talk and all these kinds of things that we say, oh, we're going to... Um, like I like to put on my mirror, I'm smart and I'm good looking, you know. <laughs> yeah, that just really loses it after a while, <laughs> that doesn't work. But, um, but the thing is, so what we find that this controlling leads to covering up more. And the covering up more leads to alienation. And it's the lies and the control and the, and the covering up and the alienation that kills us, not God. God doesn't strike us down because we only gave 90%, right? Get that, that's really important. We're killed by our secrets that just choke the living stew out of us and our need to present ourselves in a certain way and control things. And so this is the two picture. They both start with desire, but they, one ends in alienation and one ends in wholeness. And I think that's what the, the picture is here. Now, when we're alienated, I've got three words for you, and I, I worked on this, you know, because I'm a pastor, so I do this. You know, you get three W's. <laughs> okay, one of them's a stretch, okay. But um, when we're alienated, one of the tendencies is that we withdraw, right? We pull, pull back. You ever get that feeling where, you know, you just need to get away by yourself where you can you know, control your, your little world. The second W is we start to withhold. And I think the withholding comes out of fear. That, that we fear like we're not going to have whatever is needed or expected, you know, in a relationship or our, uh, in our jobs or anything. We don't know if we're going to have enough so we'd, we'd better kind of hunker down and, and keep hold of what we got. You know, I mean, I, I hear this all the time with people who, you know, they, they have been in a really bad relationship, maybe an abusive one, and they um, have an opportunity to get into a new relationship, and it's really scary because I don't know if I let this other person into my life, they might discover I'm unlovable too, so I think I'd better just keep things under wraps, right? And so we pull in and we withhold. And we withhold our love, we withhold our, our resources, and it's not that community in which we're invested in each other and we're nurturing and, and growing each other. That doesn't happen anymore. Now the third one is, okay, this is the stretch. We start to live without. 
We start to live measured lives. And I don't think that when God thought of you, he thought of rationing your life. I think he wants us to be exuberant. He wants us to be uh, generous. He wants us to be um, released. And the tendency that we have to make our world smaller is just the opposite of what God wants to have happen in us. He doesn't want to make our world smaller. He wants us to realize that our world is much bigger because of him and because of his spirit. And <clears throat> it's a whole different way of looking at things. And so um, we need to move from a desire to a passion to a commitment. And all of this, by the way, is, looks to us like out of control. It looks very much like out of control. Because when you're following Christ, who's in control? He is, not us. That's why it's so scary to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to follow you. Come into my life. Come into my heart and mind. Come, come into my relationships. Come into my world and, and be my Lord. That's really scary because that means, by definition, I have to stop trying to be my Lord. See? And, um, and then that requires faith. It doesn't take any faith for me to be in charge, by the way. Uh, don't worry about that. Uh, but it does take faith to say, okay, I'm going to let go, and I'm going to trust you, even in this, and see how life opens up instead of gets small. Does that make sense? Now, I've got to tell you, this is a really funky passage to, to uh, go into communion with because um, some of us, our mind is still stuck on the fact that the people died and got dragged out of the room. And so I don't want you to think that um, it may be you today <laughs> that gets dragged out when we do have the two ushers who are highly trained back there. <laughs> oh, they're done. They're done for the day. Okay. So, but, but the point is, when our desires are handed over to the Lord and he, and he unleashes our passion and we respond in commitment and experience his wholeness, then we're part of this community of one heart and mind. Where people don't have needs because we're caring for each other. And it's not a programmatic caring. It's a, oh, I noticed, well, okay, why not? That's totally different than um, getting a program to go take care of those people. It's, uh, there are no those people, it's just us. And we look to see how can we come alongside one another.